This is the Homestead Journey Podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. This is episode number 20 of the Homestead Journey Podcast, or as we like to say around here, step number 20 on our journey towards self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. My name is Brian Wells. I am coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York. If you are new to the podcast, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us on the journey. And if you've been listening for a while, thank you as well for taking time out of your busy schedule. I know there's a lot of things you could be doing and the fact that you are taking time out of your busy day to join us on the Homestead journey means a lot to me, so thank you very, very much. Let's jump right into this week's Homestead Happenings. This week on the Homestead, I have spent a lot of time working on our mobile chicken coop. Now, I told you a little bit about it last week, and uh, this week the work has continued And really, I've gotten a lot done on it. Very, very happy with how it's been turning out. Um, I actually did something new this week. I bought lumber from a local lumber mill. I just found out about this place last week on one of the Facebook groups. And I am somebody who likes to spend money, as much money locally as I possibly can. Now, I want to be frugal and try to stretch my dollars as much as I can. But I also, I don't mind spending a few extra dollars if that means that it's going to stay locally. Now, in this case, buying rough cut lumber, I I think I may have saved a little bit, not a whole lot, but I really have enjoyed working with the rough cut lumber. It's the first time I've ever done it and uh, definitely will not be the last. So I did all of the framing with the rough cut. I had considered actually using rough cut on the outside as well, doing kind of that board and batten style siding, but I ended up not going that route simply because this is going to be a chicken brooder as well as a coop, and I wanted to make sure that it was as draft free as possible. And since I had never done the board and batten style siding before, I wasn't quite sure I'd be able to get it as airtight as I would like. And so instead, I opted to get that uh, prefabricated, um, it kind of looks like T111, but it's not. Uh, it comes in 4 by 8 sheets at Lowe's. I think it's like 20 bucks a sheet. And I ended up going that route instead. And then I trimmed it out with pressure-treated um, lumber. The windows are actually windows that I got from my aunts. They're ones that she had had replaced a couple of years ago. And the door is something that's very, very special to me. The door on my current fixed coop is actually the door from the outside of my grandfather's chicken coop. And this door for the mobile coop is the door from the inside of his coop. His coop was divided into two rooms. And uh, so I took the door from the, the divided the two rooms and I'm using that on the mobile coop. And folks, I'll be the first one to admit I'm a bit of a sentimental old fool. Uh, <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with that at all. Uh, but I just love the fact that a part of my grandfather's legacy is living on in this coop as it has in our, our other coop. And uh, just like in our other coop, every time I open that door, I'll think of my grandfather. There'll be a smile on my face. Perhaps a tear in my eye because I miss him something fierce. Um, But the fact that a a piece of my grandfather's legacy makes up this coop is something that makes me very, very happy. Now, I have been sharing pictures of the uh, coop build on our Instagram page. If you don't follow us on Instagram or you haven't liked our Facebook page, go ahead and do that. But I have been using the hashtag 3BMobileCoop2020 on Instagram. So if you use that hashtag, you'll be able to see all of the pictures of our coop um, there. Also this week, uh, the, I don't know if you can hear it here, it's in my hot little hand. The 1020 trays that I ordered from Bootstrap Farmer without the holes arrived. And folks, I am very, very impressed with this construction. So 
Very happy with it. I think these are going to, to work well for me. These are definitely in a totally different class than the El Cheapos that you find at Walmart or Home Depot or whatever. Um, these are definitely much more, they're just sturdier. And so hopefully these will last me a long time. Initial impressions, very, very impressed. And I will let you know how things go um, using them in this year and hopefully many seasons beyond this year. Now, this week in the news, uh, unless you have had your head in the sand, <laughs> the big news this week has been the coronavirus. Um, and it's just nonstop, 24-7, coronavirus, coronavirus, coronavirus. Now, folks, I am not a medical professional. I am not trying to downplay this. Um, I'm not trying to overhype it. But let me tell you what we have done this week on our homestead to prepare for the coronavirus. Absolutely nothing. Now, I don't say that lightly. But the reason why we've done absolutely nothing to prepare for the coronavirus is because that's what we do. As homesteaders, we're always preparing. I didn't need to go down to the grocery store and stock up on a bunch of stuff because last year I started preparing. I uh, put seeds in the ground and grew my vegetables and then, and then harvested them and, and preserved them. Um, we got meat birds. We harvested a pig. So if we were quarantined for an extended period of time, we'd be able to eat good for an extended period of time. And folks, I don't say that again to be cheeky or to be flippant about it. But again, as homesteaders, that's one of the benefits of homesteading is that when these kinds of things roll around, we don't need to panic. We don't need to lose our minds because we are on that journey towards self-reliance, self-sufficiency, and sustainability. And so we have those, you know, that food stored up. We have, you know, the animals that are, that could provide us with food, whether it's eggs or, or meat or whatever. We've got those systems in place. Now, is it perfect? No. Um, there's things that we could do on our homestead to get better at this. There's things that we could do, uh, especially with regards to natural disasters. I'd like to get a PTO generator uh, that I could connect to my tractor. Um, th there are things that we could do better, uh, but we didn't need to run out to Sam's Club uh, or to Costco um, and buy toilet paper. I, although I don't get why people think they've got to stock up on toilet paper. Oh my goodness, it just cracks me up. Um, but, uh, you know, paper towels and hand sanitizer. My wife said she just got back from Hannaford and soap was almost gone. Well, at least people are washing their hands. I guess that's the upside to it. Well, you should be washing your hands all the time anyhow. Anyhow, but what did we do to prepare for the coronavirus this week? Not a whole lot. And again, that's not me trying to be flippant or to say that this is no big deal. I don't know whether it's not a big, whether it's a big deal or whether it isn't, whether it's media hype or whether this is actually um, some kind of catastrophic event that's taking place. All I know is that because we are homesteaders, we're well situated to handle something like this. The last thing I want to share with you is something that took place here on our homestead yesterday. And this was a near catastrophe. My wife and I and our son were skiing yesterday at the local ski area. Um, probably going to be our last hurrah just because of how things are going to fall over the next couple of weeks with some things we've got going on. But anyhow, so we were there skiing when I got a text from some friends of ours. They had stopped by to drop some stuff off uh, here at the house and they texted me and said, you've got a pig loose. This is the first time one of our pigs have ever escaped outside of our perimeter fence. Now I've had them break from paddock to paddock and we've had some pregnancies, unplanned pregnancies that resulted, but I've never had a pig break outside of the perimeter fence. But here I, I'm at the ski area I'm on the lift, actually, literally going up the hill, and I get this text, you've got a pig out. I said, don't worry about it, I will come home. So we got off the uh, mountain, jumped in the car, we came home and discovered the sow rooting through some bags of garbage. Um, now, we have uh, a local company that comes and picks up our garbage every week, and the cans were still at the end of the road because I hadn't taken the time to bring them back. 
And so my wife had done some clean out and I had just taken those bags and put them under the carport and anticipating that I was going to bring the cans back. And this is what the pig had gotten into. Thankfully, they had called us because in that bag was a box containing old rat poison. She did not get into that box, thank God. But they literally saved my bacon. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I am, whew, I just think of how that could have gone if uh, she had been able to continue munching through and gotten into that rat poison. That's definitely not anything that I would want uh, to see with my pigs. But thankfully, they contacted us, we got home, and she went right back into the pen so easily. I had some... Um, some spent barley uh, that I get from a local uh, brewery and uh, she literally was chasing me down the hill like I was running and she was just booking right after me and went right back into her pen where she's supposed to be but that could have not ended well thank God that it did well speaking of pigs let's jump on over to this week's charting the course This week, I would like to talk about American guinea hogs, and I want to share with you why we raise them on our homestead and why you might want to consider them as a pig for your homestead. But before we jump into that, let me just kind of introduce you to the breed in case you're not familiar with the American guinea hog. Now, this is coming from guineahogs.org, which is the website for the American Guinea Hog Association. So... If you want to read more information about the American guinea hog, that's a great place to start. Um, the American guinea hog, though, it's a sustainable heritage farm pig known for its moderate size, excellent forage abilities, friendly temperament, excellently flavored meat, and indispensable lard. It's smaller than industrial hog breeds, but it's a good size farm pig providing a nice well-marbled carcass. There is a lot of variability because it is a land race breed from the standpoint of how tall they get, how long they get, and how big they actually grow to become. Um, but generally speaking, they can range anywhere from about 150 to 300 pounds, and they reach butchering weight at about 18 months. Now that is a really quick, uh, simple summary of all of the information that's found on guineahogs.org. I would highly recommend that you visit that site to find out more about the American guinea hogs. I will definitely provide a link to that in the show notes. Uh, but the American guinea hog is a great pig. We absolutely love it. However, sometimes I've heard people refer to it as the perfect homestead hog. And folks, if you've been listening to this podcast any length of time, you will know that I don't go there. Each homestead is so unique. Each homestead has its own set of goals, its own set of challenges. And so I don't believe there is anything that is going to fit every homestead. Now, if there is something that you can think of that would fall into that category, by all means, let me know. You can contact me at thehomesteadjourneypodcast at gmail.com or you can contact us on Facebook or Instagram and let me know what I'm missing. But every homestead is so unique, and every homestead has its own set of goals, its own challenges, all of those kinds of things, that I certainly don't think that there is a perfect anything that is going to fit every homestead, whether it's a gardening method, an animal, you know, a pig, a chicken, a cow, whatever. Um, there's just, it doesn't exist. But having said that, I do think that the American guinea hog can be a great addition to a homestead. It just depends on what your goals are and what your needs are. Let me share with you some of the reasons why we raise American guinea hogs. Number one is their temperament. This was a huge factor in us getting American guinea hogs and us getting pigs here on 3B Farm and Homestead. I had known for a long time that I wanted to get pigs here. Um, but I also didn't want anything on the homestead that I was afraid of or that I had to be worried about my wife and son being around. Um, and folks, if you know anything at all about pigs, pigs can be vicious animals. 
Yeah, they're not maybe as big as uh, certain breeds of cow, but a 700-pound mad boar or crazed sow is not something that you're necessarily going to easily be able to handle. And that is something that I did not want on our homestead. I didn't want to have to be worried about it because I had a very aggressive animal or a mean sow or a mean boar um, that I was worried. I didn't want that. And so for us, the temperament of the American guinea hog was a huge factor. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't get a mean American guinea hog or that you uh, you you know, you've got to treat these animals with respect. But people who have been breeding American guinea hogs for years have focused on breeding the sweet ones and eating the mean ones. And that has led to a breed that overall, generally speaking, is very, very chill. They're like a big, huge puppy dog that wants belly rubs. Now, you got to be careful because sometimes they'll drop down at your feet at the most inopportune times. And, you know, your boars especially, they can grow the tusks that kind of come out. You want to be careful they're not brushing up against you um, and, you know, pushing around. Because, again, these are large animals. But by and large, they have sweet, sweet personalities. And that was a big factor for us. Now, the second reason that I like the American guinea hog is its size. It's not a huge pig. I didn't want a 400, a 500, a, you know, a 700 pound animal, again, that I was having to worry about keeping contained and having to somehow control this animal. They're a moderately sized pig, you know, 150 to 300 pounds. Mine, generally speaking, uh, don't, they're a little bit more in the middle of, of that range. Um, so I really, really like that. It's perfect for a family of three. You know, if I was feeding more than that, I'd just dress off too. But their size from the standpoint of manageability, and again, we only have a little over two acres of land here. So it's not like I could have 30 700-pound pigs running around this property. I don't have room for that. My neighbors wouldn't be very happy with me if I had that many pigs here. But uh, with the smaller American guinea size, a, a hog size, it definitely has worked well for us. The third reason why I was drawn to the American guinea hog was the fact that they have a little bit more marbled meat. So this is not your other white meat. It's not the lean, tasteless stuff that you get at the store. Now, if you like that lean, tasteless stuff that you get at the store, the American guinea hog is probably not for you. But if you like fat and you like flavor because fat is flavor, the American guinea hog is going to be right down your alley. But not only is it nicely marbled meat, it also produces uh, a, quite a bit of lard. And, you know, it, it kind of, you know, trends come and go, but it seems like lard is kind of coming back into vogue. Uh, and people are starting to recognize that there are a lot of health benefits from consuming, now, good lard, okay? Lard that has been, it comes from pigs that have been fed properly and not just been fed garbage and crap. I certainly don't think that you're going to find the same health benefits buying lard at the store that you would in lard that comes from a pasture-raised pig. But that was another draw for me because cooking with lard, I think it makes things taste better. Baking with lard certainly makes things taste better. In fact, Last year at the uh, county fair, my son made a blueberry pie and entered it into um, the pie contest there. And uh, the judge was just blown away by the crust and wanted to know what his secret ingredient was. And he said, well, I use lard from our American guinea hogs. And uh, she just kept eating it, eating it. And generally, they take a couple of bites and, and uh, that's it. He brought in a four-inch pie. And when it was all said and done, I had to struggle to find the sliver of pie that uh, was left because she ate so much of it. And uh, then he was selected to uh, bake a pie and send it to the New York State Fair. But what was it? The secret ingredient was lard from our American guinea hogs. Another reason why I was drawn to the American guinea hog is that they have good mothering 
instincts. Generally speaking, they farrow easily and they take good care of their little ones. And if they don't, then you just don't breed them again. I don't want to pass on those traits to the next generation. And so part of all of this, the benefits of this breed is because there have been breeders throughout the years who have bred for particular characteristics. And as breeders now, we have a responsibility to carry on those kinds of things and ensure that we are breeding only sows that are good mothers to pass on those good instincts. But generally speaking, the American Guinea hog is known for easy farrowings and good mothering instincts. Another reason why I like the American Guinea hog is they are very feed efficient. They will take less feed, even though it's going to take them longer to reach butchering weight. Generally speaking, they're going to take less feed than just free feeding a, and I'm going to use huge air quotes here, regular pig. They have great versatility, and so some people will keep them on pasture. Some people will feed them hog feed. Some people will feed them uh, day-old bread. Some people will feed them spent grains. Some people will feed them uh, vegetables, scraps. They have great versatility from the standpoint of the feed that they can survive on. It's just a matter of understanding uh, their body condition and then feeding them and adjusting things accordingly. Now that's not to say that they're going to get by on uh, nothing. You still have to have some kind of inputs, whether you are rotating them around on good pasture or you're giving them good hog feed. But generally speaking, they are very feed efficient and can survive and thrive on a variety of different diets. Now, what are some of the downsides to raising American guinea hogs? Well, first of all, and this is probably the biggest one, and that is that they are slow growing. It generally speaking will take them about 18 months, and in some cases maybe a little bit more, to reach butchering weight. Some people will take them to 24 months. Now, a lot of this depends on the bloodlines that are there. Um, and so some people have a little quicker growing American guinea hogs and some people have a little smaller growing American guinea hogs and some people have American guinea hogs that have a larger carcass and some a smaller carcass. So some of it has to do with the bloodlines, but by and large, they are a slower growing pig. And so if people have in their minds that they want to, you know, kind of that traditional get the piglet in the spring and dress it off in the fall, that six month kind of commitment, the American guinea hog is not going to be a good fit. While I listed size as a plus or a pro with regards to the American guinea hog, for some people it's also a downside. The fact that the American guinea hog is a moderately sized pig for some people is unacceptable. They want the larger sized market hogs. A common misunderstanding though, with even my processor that I've used for several years now, is that there isn't going to be any bacon on a pig this size. And every year that I take a pig to be processed, I get back plenty of bacon. And that's simply because the American guinea hog is built differently than the market hogs. But for some people, the size is a downside. Another downside to the American guinea hog is that the need to restrict feed results in a little bit more labor. A lot of people when they're raising pigs they take a hundred pounds or even a couple of thousand pounds and put them in big huge feeders and uh, they feed their pigs uh, maybe once a week. With the American guinea hog you pretty much have to feed them every day and we choose to feed them twice a day. A lot of it is going to depend on how you choose to manage your herd, but restricting the, the feed does result in more labor to produce the pork. Now for me, I also see that as a benefit because I'm out there interacting with my pigs. In fact, Troy over at Red Tool House uh, was doing an experiment in the last couple of weeks with regards to fermenting 
uh, feed for his hogs. Now he's raising, I can't remember, it's not American guinea hogs. I can't remember what breed it is or what mix he's raising. But he used to just put the feed in the big uh, hoppers and, you know, load it up every once a week or something like that. But now he's fermenting the pig, the feed for his pigs, and so he's interacting with his pigs on a daily basis. And what he's finding is that his pigs are less wild acting because he's interacting with them on a daily basis. So certainly uh, that additional labor, I think, does have upsides to it, but restricting feed does mean more labor. That's just a fact. The final downside that we're going to talk about uh, with regards to the American guinea hog is that raising this breed does require a level of effort uh, with regards to educating people from customers to your processor. You're constantly having to educate people about the American guinea hog. It's a breed that is not very common. It's a breed that, although it is more common than it used to be, but uh, you're constantly having to explain to people what it is, that this meat is not going to be the um, standard white meat that you find at the store. When they go to process it, it may need to be processed a little bit differently, that there is actually going to be bacon that is attainable. Um, and so you do find yourself having to put in a lot more effort with regards to teaching people about the American guinea hog rather than just simply selling pork or selling pigs. A couple of weeks ago, I was at a homesteading event and I was talking to some people there and they're people who have been following the pattern of buying piglets in the spring and harvesting those pigs in the fall. And uh, they found out that I was a breeder of pigs. And so they were like, hey, let me have your contact information. And I said to them, I said, no, you don't want my contact information because the breed of pig that I have requires a commitment that's far beyond the six months that you are wanting to put in. And folks, that's not a, a, a dig at them. Uh, their goals and their needs are different than my goals and my needs. And so... I am not going to push an American guinea hog into a situation like that because they're going to be disappointed. They're going to talk bad about the American guinea hog. And it's not that the American guinea hog did anything wrong or that they did anything wrong. It would be that I did something wrong because I didn't educate them on the nuances and the differences with regards to the American guinea hog. Folks, I absolutely love my American guinea hogs. I absolutely do. I feel like their pros definitely outweigh the cons. I don't mind the fact that they're slower growing. I don't mind the size. In fact, the size for us is a perfect size. Um, the labor, additional labor, for me is not that big of a deal. I enjoy going out and interacting with my pigs on a daily basis, even in the winter time. Now, I don't enjoy hauling water in the winter. I had a plan this year to deal with the water a little bit differently, and I didn't fully get that launched. I'm going to try a little bit different approach to watering them next year. I don't even mind going out and interacting with them in the winter time. I really don't. I I love my pigs. I really do, and I love their temperament. I love you know, they'll, they'll come over and flop over and want those belly rubs. Uh, I enjoy um, just watching them and uh, listening to them grunt and kind of, you know, I, I just, I love them. I absolutely love these pigs. I enjoy eating them. They are tasty, tasty, tasty pigs. Their hams might not be as big as other breeds, but boy, are they good. The bacon is amazing. The sausage from the American guinea hog is amazing. My wife grabbed a butt roast out of the freezer the other day and made some pulled pork that was to die for. The American guinea hog is a tasty, tasty pig. And the lard, it, I just absolutely love cooking with it. We love baking with it. Um, I absolutely love the American guinea hog. If you are interested in the American guinea hog, I would definitely recommend that you check out guineahogs.org. Contact me. I am always happy to talk pigs. Uh, I have contacts throughout pigdom. 
um, in the American Guinea Hog uh, Association that uh, would be happy to talk pigs with you. We can get you in contact with a breeder close to you if you're interested in just seeing the animals. Um, we have people that would be more than happy to show you the American guinea hogs so that you can get a feel for this breed and maybe, just maybe, you'll fall in love with it like I did and it will be the perfect homestead hog for you. All right, folks, that is it for this episode. I hope you have enjoyed it. If you have any other questions about the American guinea hog or you have any questions about anything that I've shared up to this point, feel free to reach out to me, the Homestead Journey Podcast at gmail.com, or you can contact us on Facebook or Instagram or via our YouTube channel. As always, the music on this episode was provided by Audionautics.com. A big shout out to them. If you haven't already, I'd really appreciate it if you'd pop on over to iTunes and leave us a review or whatever your favorite podcast platform is. Uh, leave us a review, a thumbs up, a like, whatever your platform, preferred platform allows. It'll help other people find this show and share this show with other people. Um, I would really appreciate it. We're growing every week, and that's because of folks like you that are willing to spend a few moments out of your day to listen to me babble on about homesteading. I really, really appreciate it. All right, folks, until next time, keep up the good work.